Try again? Oh yeah, that's good. Okay. So, welcome back. Um, this is our final session. Uh, we'll have a chance later to carry on some of these conversations, but I hope we can bring you in with this one. Uh, and for sure, we'll try and bring you in for the final wrap-up session where I'm going to have a chat with Cedric about our takeaways. Um, just to engage you from the get-go, and before I introduce our final panel, um, let's just pop up our last three questions of the day. You've got your uh, clever gizmo in your pocket. Here's the question. We've talked a bit about these, uh, the connectedness of everything from policies to buildings to um, the Internet of Things where gadgets all talk to one another. So what do you feel could be the benefit of smart homes? where an Internet of Things was utilized. That's quite a long question. Have a look at it. So we've got four options along the bottom. The one that's just popped up is usefulness towards design and planning. We've just talked a bit about that. Uh, the one at the other end is about energy monitoring and reduction. So this whole notion of being in charge, being in control. We've talked a bit about smart meters today. We've talked about other ways of, of keeping track of things. Uh, convenience, remote use, a whole range of ways in which we can... Uh, use things more easily and things talk to themselves. Your fridge tells you when you need some eggs or whatever it is. Uh, and then the, the, the usefulness. We've talked a bit about behaviors, attitudes, uh, human-centered design, which is where Adam kind of started this morning. So just to get a sense of where you guys are. So we're jumping around a little bit, but energy is kind of up there. Convenience is up there. Okay, so that gives us a good sense of where you are. Also helps the panel understand a wee bit where your um, priorities are. And let's jump to the next question, please, folks. So the next one is more about the organization. Um, and we've just seen in some of those little innovation shots outside the way in which organization in Torino is using apps. Uh, again, lots of organizations developing new tools, better ways of feeding back, making life easier for your customers, your tenants. Uh, so do you see that happening? Uh, or are we still catching up a little bit. That looks pretty good. That looks pretty encouraging. So, you know, 60, 50, okay, maybe I'll stop talking, you know, I'll <laughs> stop going down. Um, so those figures look reasonably healthy. Uh, and the no, 20% no. So one in five still saying no. So we're, we're certainly not there yet. Uh, and this is still work in progress. And then let's jump to the final one. And the final one is a kind of takeaway question, I guess, for Housing Europe. Um, this is just really about the areas in which you'd like to see Housing Europe facilitate more of an exchange. Uh, we had Bernd at the end of the finals, the previous session, talked about some of the work they're trying to do. They're looking for partners, collaborators, uh, other actors across Europe. Housing Europe has this fantastic reach and this great, really powerful network of members. So again, how would you like them to use that, that, that power and that connectedness uh, to encourage exchange between between uh, some of the, some of the members, so sustainability is way ahead of everything else. There, sustainability means different things to different people, of course. So we might get into that. Um, okay, super. Thank you very much. So let's pop up the slide for our panel, if we can, and let's um, let's uh, we're going to turn to this question of livability and affordability. We've talked about affordability already. Um, livability is one of these questions, again, it's not easy to define. It means different things to different people. So we're going to have, a, I guess, a spread of inputs from our panel. Um, again, we've got a great range of experience um, and uh, fantastic ha to have great quality of speakers throughout today. Um, so first of all, Kevin Curran, Professor of Cyber Security at the University of Ulster, someone who's very well known in digital services and a lot of writing. Uh, teaching, a real kind of thought leader in the field. So um, especially in this whole question of uh, security, which is increasingly, I mean, two days ago, was it? We had a huge crash with Visa at the weekend. So you all, all around us, you know, on a more regular basis, we're, we're being made aware of just how important this whole issue of security is with, with uh, digital issues. Um, and then Stuart Hitchman. Uh, Stuart's based in the, in the Midlands in the UK, working with uh, Rooftop Housing Group. Uh, working with, uh, I think, 7,000 housing units, uh, working specifically with um, a, a range of different uh, customers from Roma communities to older people, young people. So again, looking at that, that diverse customer base, and this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. So good to have you with us, Stuart. 
Um, and then we're going to hear from Art, Art Wijnan, who's de Twee Snooken in, the ne in the Netherlands, who's going to be talking a bit about this, um, the, the, the Dutch uh, data infrastructure work across the, the whole of the Netherlands. And again, we've heard some interesting examples. We talked about the Eindhoven 3D printing, so that seems to be a in everyone's eye at the moment, but lots of interesting things happening in the Netherlands. So Art, nice of you to join us. And then finally, we have uh, Eha Vork. Uh, great for you to join us, Eha, uh, Deputy Mayor of, of Tallinn. We heard from the Mayor this morning. It's really nice that you've given up time also to spend with us today. Um, I think you're going to present in Estonian, so if you've given back your headsets, you might have to look under your chair and, 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 and find a pair. So, And then hopefully we'll have a chance for a little bit of an exchange at the end. That's the plan. Uh, let's dive in. Kevin, I'm going to give you the floor first. Uh, I think you've got a Prezi you're going to share with us. Okay, good to see you. And, and again, we'll try and stick to time. I'll stand up when we're just about ready just to give you a little bit of a, because it's easy to get carried away. So uh, good to see you. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. That's great. So I'm going to speak mostly about security from an IT perspective at a, at a high level. But just to tell you who I am, usually when I Nowadays, when I teach students, I have to tell them, give them this warning in case of fire. Um, and it's impossible to ask students to turn off their mobile <laughs> phones in class. So I work at Ulster University. We're a multi-campus university based between Belfast and Derry on the left side of the north. I came via Helsinki to the beautiful town or city of Tallinn. So just to say, I do research with my students, or should I say my students do research for me in security and distributed systems, but mostly security in the last number of years. And I also do write for, or provide media commentary for a lot of IT magazines and for popular press again. So back in my early days when I had a full head of hair, I was scandalized by a research paper we did showing that wireless networks had insecurities and of course, I'd been working in this field for many years, and I just presumed it would be, it was, everyone knew this, but I was one of the first in the UK to point this out, and it went sensational, and I almost lost my job. But um, my boss calmed down and realized that we didn't actually take any information out of these networks, but then I became known as the guy to go to for security stories. So since then, I've been doing a lot of media, and my media profile has been going up again, so all because of my bad boys days. So security is very important as we so every single day there is a breach somewhere. It's not has your password been disclosed in any breach, it's just how many breaches have your passwords in them and that is why it's important to have a different password for the important sites. Any site which is connected to your credit card, you know, that's the site you protect. You don't have to have the long complex passwords on sites where you're just logging in to read a news bulletin, but anything which is connected to your credit card, you have to have a unique password on there. Again, so again, we're seeing network breaches increasing all the time, and still email spam. Clicking on a link in an email is still one of the number one, the com number one common vector for getting malware onto systems. Again, so just like you said, even though the visa problem in the UK was huge last week with bars shutting down toll roads having um, traffic backlogs for miles. One in three pounds in the UK is processed by Visa. Now that happened to be a hardware, a hardware failure, but that could have easily been a ransomware attack. It could have easily been a system security hack again. So again, look how reliant we become on cyber systems and IT infrastructure for everything. So again, you can see in the future we're really, we're gonna face those issues again, so. There was in Atlanta where a ransomware um, cyber attack happened um, there last year, or t this year actually, um, or just recently, and there's been, been ones last year again, and they, they brought the public infrastructure to a halt again. So again, ransomware is enabled by cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Up until a few years ago, really, you just couldn't do ransomware attacks. You couldn't do denial of service attacks is where you bring a website to its knees because you couldn't monetize it. Anyone who did denial of service attacks were just bored or they were just trying to do a type of online um, campaign of harassment, but they couldn't make money. But now with virtually untraceable cryptocurrencies like Monero and Bitcoin, you can monetize them. 
and believe me that the hackers are out there trying to do that and making money off their of these systems again again a lot of scripts a lot of sites now a lot of the malware you get on your computers are actually using your computer to mine cryptocurrency that a lot of the ads again so there's number one reason to run an ad blocker is your browsing speeds up but number two is it stops a lot of these ads which are malicious by themselves so running an ad blocker is actually a security precaution as well and it does speed up your your browser you can get a plug-in for any browser quite quickly ad blockers are good <laughs> again here is another way in this is like an internet of things device anything which connects to the internet really is what we call an internet of things device and there was a hack in a the casino there lately just uh, this year actually but it was through the thermometer in the fish tank which they had connected to the internet with a default password um, again so again a hacker when you're in charge of security for business you've got to be able to protect every single every single avenue in but the hacker only has to get lucky once um, again so the more devices we have connected to the internet the more the more routes we we give to those who are trying to penetrate our networks as well so um, again so these are attacks that make you want to cry so here again you see these ones again where you're using different typefaces where a message comes in you look at the url it seems okay but it's actually using a different font if you look underneath the d you can see the the, the, um, the dot underneath the d and it's not a d character so that url is registered by those hackers and then you, they can run malware on there as well so again it becomes quite difficult of course to to be able to blacklist and whitelist every single site but there's incredible low skilled attacks like this which are happening all the time again so and again for many years we also say just like i said before you don't click on the link in an email but last year there was a link that was in effect in powerpoint files and you didn't have to click on the link in the powerpoint slide if you hovered the mouse over the link at any stage it activated the link as if you clicked in it um, again they'd run javascript inside their uh, they'd have something called powershell which is in windows again which allows you to execute powerful commands but Again, we have very clever people on the dark side who are, who are creating these exploits again. Um, so remember there's this cartoon here about <laughs> the security questions that we get asked again, which are all over social media. But I do find companies are moving away from your mother's maiden name and where were you born. But again, so again, and of course, IT technicians will tear their hair out when they see things like this. So this is where someone where a PC goes to sleep after a few minutes, set up by the comp company to do that for security reasons. But here's someone who discovered that if they put their watch underneath the mouse, it keeps, keeps the computer alive and it doesn't go into sleep mode. But of course, it's a, it's a security risk. Yeah. Again, so hackers find flaws in lots of ways. So the dorks, the simplest thing is go to Google and you type in dorks, like up there, external SQL in text, at gmail.com in text password. That's just a Google dork is what we say. You go to Google, you put in certain search queries that go and throw of all the sites which are obviously harvested and searched by Google and you look for passwords in ordinary documents which Google searched. Now you don't have to be, you know, spend five years doing a degree to get, but again, that's a very effective way. There's databases which are set up with famous Google dork. Um, there's just one I did and I got um, last week and a lot of passwords appeared in there. There's a Google hacking database which gives you all these dorks again these text strings some of them quite complex if you just cut and paste them go to Google and you will find a lot of devices out there a lot of databases online a lot of information and you don't need to like I said have gone to college and become um, a computer security expert it really is just using Google and you know about this search engine and this database you can do a lot of damage. Um, again, there is also tools like this, which are, again, which are created for the pros, and again, they're being added to all the time, but they still make it so much easier. Every time there's a new exploit, the hackers release it. Again, there's also tools like this we use for finding our... But again, there's this information search engine called Shodan.io. That has got thousands of Internet of Things devices, which, like Webcam XP, you type them in, you find all these webcams which people have, and the default passwords are all listed. Again, so again, you don't have to be connected. That search engine exists entirely for the Internet of Things devices. Just go for it. So again, this is for when you bring down a website. It's very easy to do. Wireless networks, again, are a great place we go to. Just to show you, but a Ashley Madison is a place where you log on to if you want to have an affair. 
The database was released last year, of course, very, very sensitive. But you didn't have to, I can go to websites like the Adult Friend Finder, and if they don't program it correctly, I can type in someone's email. And of course, it'll come back and say, in that case, invalid email. But if I typed in the correct email in that website, it doesn't give me any error. It just says invalid password. Therefore, I can check if my boss is registered for Adult Friend Finder. Do you see? Programmers should know that whenever someone types in a wrong email or a wrong, pa you know, especially, it shouldn't give any information back. That's called enumeration. But programmers don't know that. So there's websites you can go to and you can find out if your colleague is registered on there again. But ordinary people don't know that. That's the Ashley Madison database, which I checked for any colleagues if they were in there. <laughs> again, so I just, again, just, to, so IoT and smart cities again. So just again, sir, is that my time? Yeah, so here, just again, th this really amazes me. This is a street light. <laughs> and it shows you the devices you can put into a street light. So again, you know, you have your water detectors, you have your environmental sensors, your, your facade lighting, control receptacles, digital street signs, um, indicator lights, wireless control. Um, again, you can have a mesh up there for giving Wi-Fi out again. You have your smart grid street lights again, music, announcements, alerts, image sensor for pr proximity to the number of people in an area. You can count the pedestrians. You can have security <laughs> things in there. And a push to talk blue button emergency call station. And again, there's actually, there's another slide that comes from us with even more features, but just to show you the technology that will probably go into our street lights and a lot of things. You can do a lot in a small little um, area to add Internet of Things devices. But again, again, just saying, should we trust in tech? Look at the Visa network hardware. Again, the Ukrainian power grid was taken down by a cyber attack last year. They had no electricity for a few days. Um, again, so cities need to establish security operation centers and vulnerability assessment and incident response planning. So again, it's great to wire up a city, put in all the devices, but really you have to have IT teams which are there to support it. And what happens when it goes down? And it can be as simple as, do you have a paper-based system you know, to be able to do whatever it is? Collect parking tolls for a few days or whatever else. Again, just to presume the worst case, but also have these operation centers again. That's great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kevin. And uh, I think our present the presentation as well. You're going to share the presentation. We'll have yeah. we'll be able to have that. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. So you've scared the bejazzes out of us all, to use a good Irish phrase. And we're all changing our passwords and our credit cards and checking to see if our colleagues are on Ashley Madison. So thanks for all that stuff. So, and, and we might get back in the conversation about what this means for social housing guys, which is where I think Stuart might come in. So Stuart, um, nice to see you. Um, please come and take the, the, uh, the lectern. Uh, you're, you've got a big picture overview working with a, uh, a big social housing provider in the Midlands in the UK. Again, the floor is yours, so we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I suppose I'm going to bring a perspective from a, a practitioner in terms of in social housing, uh, in a very much what we termed as a rural housing association. So I think today we've got some great presentations and we've seen some very strategic kind of city views. And equally, we heard some stats today about, uh, I can't remember what year, um, but 66% of people in urban. Uh, the flip side of that, of course, is 33% will be in not in urban. And therefore, we're not going to forget those people. And what are we going to do to support them? So, racing on. Um, I think uh, those of us have been around long enough. Ten years ago, we maybe we heard the phrase um, the, the digital divide, and I think that was very much in the early days of internet connectivity. But today, life moves on, and I think it's a, one of those moments. Something's getting close to you. The digital divide now is coming along in terms of the connectivity, uh, in terms of IT or ICT uh, products. Uh, capabilities so it's not just broadband it's uh, 4g connectivity it's the internet of things it's all of that is now a accessible source if you have money and you have the connectivity so i think key here is to really think about so for our sector it's the accessibility it's the quality and it's the affordability that is really key to us and I think uh, as a federation or collective of federations, we need to keep that in focus 
and we're on our digital journey and making sure we're not going to leave people behind on that journey. Perspective, I suppose. Um, in the UK, 1.1 million uh, businesses, homes, uh, don't have a decent quality broadband connection. That is huge. So while we have our vision, uh, we have our vision of the future, obviously we're looking at leadership and uh, again through federations and others, this is where we need to drive the, the world of our countries in terms of making sure that connectivity is available. So uh, again, broadband, qualities of broadband, the infrastructures to deliver that is fundamental, huge investments. Uh, but only by lobbying are we going to make some inroads to that. And that's where we need to make that mark. As you see, I guess, given my job, uh, IT, uh, there's a lots of uh, little stats in there in, in detail, devil in that detail. Uh, but I think there's a real realisation that we, we could be leaving people behind and we absolutely must endeavour to not leave people behind on our digital journey. So, as you see, um, certainly in the UK, super fast broadband, which is clearly what we're all endeavouring to do, is a slow progression. But at the end of the day, it is a slow progression. And I think that's what we really need to focus on. And of course, it's not very much the, uh, the, the fibre, the copper infrastructure these days, but very much the mobile signal. So 4G, 5G now coming into its pilot phase. That capability, again, the coverage is still not there. And I think we, again, through our trade federations, absolutely must push and push that kind of message through government and various other locations. So, uh, one of the presentations today, we said uh, we've got um, two ears, one mouth, listening. Um, it's very much a, a a theme in the UK now about listening to our people. What do our residents say? What do they mean? What do they understand by? And I think a simple graphic in terms of if you think of a smart home. So what do people think? Where are their concerns? And you'll see um, affordability is a high issue for them. Similarly, uh, we've had a dip into um, security but also, there's a range of issues that clearly our customers, our tenants, our residents have issues about. And for us to make progress, we need to address that. And how are we going to do that? That's the only way we can do that is by engaging in a number of ways. And in my last slide, the summary, we think hopefully we'll pick up the key points we need to pick up as organisations to drive home this, this, this uh, fantastic journey we're on. Uh, but it's a very interesting journey. So where are we now? So yes, you, you're very familiar with some of this stuff, but it's the realisation of we are at the early stages of a, a digital journey. So we still are in a, the early stages of uh, number of people with the amount of uh, devices. Um, you'll see some great statistics on those type of devices now coming into homes. Uh, so. Smart TVs, everybody's saying smart TV. To a degree, it's only smart if it's actually connected to the internet, otherwise it's just a TV. So really bearing in mind that there's a lot of hype in terms of what's being sold, but it's about the capability, and that capability can only be realized once it has that connectivity. Again, I think we talked about in terms of our homes, we talked about uh, some of the, the, the IoT things that are now coming in, which people can really start to make uh, use of. Uh, and there is one in terms of the uh, thermometer, uh, thermostats in terms of controlling. But also we talked uh, earlier on today about smart energy, smart meters. And there's a great stat there. Over 50% of people using a smart meter have actually improved their fuel usage. And I think that that's a real testament to therefore why we're doing it and the the ability for us to make it happen uh, by driving it through in terms of how we deliver it and how we as housing organisations really bring that home to our customers to be able to achieve that, that win. Uh, 
I'm not sure you just about get that graphic. It's just a picture, you know, uh, 2017. Those are the type of devices. But if you look at the percentages, it's still, as of now, it's still a small margin. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of infrastructure, uh, security, capability, people's understanding to be able to realize those statistics and make them grow. And there's a the complete range there in terms of you seeing, in terms of the health, um, smart goods, and a range of things there which are really in their infancy. And that's where we are now. And if we want to reach our vision in terms of our strategic views we've been talking about today, we've got to take our people on that journey. So, uh, in summary, what do we want to do? What should we do? What should we do in terms of leaders? Um, so, investment in inf infrastructure, really making that come home. Is that through the government? Is that through our trade bodies? Is that through working with industry? Uh, how do we do it? But it's something we absolutely must do. Um, briefly, I had a chat on IoT, security. Yes, people. Um, yes, if you name your, your, your password is your favorite son, as they say, um, it's going to get found out. But equally, people have got a part to play, but equally industry, in terms of what they're doing with IoT, uh, what they're delivering to market, mass market, if it's being delivered with vulnerabilities, then that's wrong. And th again, this is where we need to lobby industry in terms of improving the quality of uh, IoT equipment. Privacy concerns. Again, great concern. GDPR, who doesn't know about GDPR? <laughs> uh, that um, that kind of hit the streets uh, only weeks ago. But it's a march on in terms of making businesses um, accountable to being a, a body that is responsible for dealing with privacy and making sure it's done properly. And I think we should have more laws in that direction in terms of that. Products to be more affordable and usable. Uh, that's uh, an obvious. Um, industry to support interoperability. So again, that's very much um, these devices talking to each other or having that generic capability to talk to each other. Huge issue. Uh, again, that needs a lot of work and we need to petition in industry to make that happen. And don't ever forget the IT literacy thing. We need to be able to help and steer people, um, and especially in our market where we have some very vulnerable people, we have some very people that uh, need that support, and if we want to take them on that journey, we absolutely need to give them support and make it happen. Else they will be in our digital divide. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stuart. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. We'll pick up on some of those key points, especially the ones at the end, I think. Uh, let's jump across the North Sea from uh, the UK to the Netherlands. Uh, Art Feynman, working with Dietwee Snooken. Uh, okay. Art? Over to you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll do it this way. Uh, yeah. Yes? Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Art Weinen, we are from the Twee Snooker. That means two pipes, two... Uh, It means uh, two pikes, as uh, river sharks they are. Um, we uh, are a company of about 100 uh, uh, designers, architects, and uh, IT specialists. We work in, in three parties. Uh, architecture, we create buildings, uh, town halls, houses. Uh, also, uh, software for uh, our colleagues. Uh, they make BIM models uh, with that, for example. And we made uh, a digital platform which enables uh, inhabitants to play with their houses and simulate things. And that's called Won't Connect. And uh, it's uh, picked up by uh, our um, uh, national government who tries to um, experiment with it in a large scale di di digitalization of houses. And this is a picture with uh, some of our ministers and uh, me and other uh, public and private parties. Um, and what we try to do is to make 3D models of uh, the houses in our uh, country. 
And we do, we do that by using uh, BIM elements to construct uh, the models with them. It, c it can go uh, to the detail of a nail if you want. And, and if you do it properly, you can ask uh, several questions at that houses and neighborhoods. And you can calculate and simulate uh, calculations with it. For example, check if uh, the houses are safe and if they are up to the regulations. Um, we can uh, uh, check if uh, it's uh, accessible, for example, for wheelchairs or rollators, or is how usable they are for th those uh, things. Uh, also, uh, uh, sustainability, to improve the houses, uh, reduce uh, uh, carbon dioxide emission, for example. And by that, we're not only looking at the technical and uh, physical aspects of the houses in the neighborhood, but we also are interested in the the uh, the, the ideas of the inhabitants. What do they think about their houses and their neighborhood? That's uh, the keystone for us to, uh, to start uh, improving. Uh, at last, we want to improve the earth, but we, we start with building parts. Um, this is a, a collaboration between uh, a lot of people, and we try to uh, address national needs. For example, we have uh, big problems in the northern part of our little country with earthquakes. There was a lot of gas behind uh, and in the ground and we took it out and that's uh, not uh, that's a problem at the moment so we have to reduce our gas uh, consumption but also carbon dioxide consumption and on the other hand we want to do that by uh, uh, addressing people and help them to improve their houses by their own needs like for example more comf uh, comfort or uh, the possibility to live longer in your house if you get older so we try to, to look what are the, the drivers for people to improve their houses and neighborhoods. And that we do by analyzing uh, big data, but also by uh, surveying by the uh, uh, inhabitants. And if we know what we want, the, the public and private parties, we can uh, put options to the 3D models of the house and then they can simulate it. It's uh, uh, for the big uh, challenge we are uh, focusing is uh, at the moment uh, uh, necessary that we all work together. So it's a public-private uh, collaboration, the government, the residents, cons the construction companies, uh, they all uh, are used to work in projects, but they have to produce products. Uh, network operators, uh, under the ground there's a lot of uh, infrastructure which can be uh, used, but also can uh, do another thing not. We want all, all electric houses and our uh, electricity network isn't fit for that. We work together with scientists, contractors, housing corporations in the industry. Now, uh, some examples of how it looks. Uh, here we see a couple of uh, buildings in Holland, uh, uh, single houses but also apartment blocks uh, in the 3D uh, environment. And um, you can uh, make uh, 3D and 2D room, uh, models from them. And uh, you can, for example, simulate a new out, uh, a new facade. How do, what do the residents think of that? Which colors do they like or not? Which doors? They also can uh, uh, make complaints about their house and can uh, register it uh, centrally. What's a very uh, uh, Good feature is the uh, creation of uh, scenarios uh, to uh, make uh, houses and apartment blocks more sustainable. Sustainable. You can see what it costs, also what it uh, gives you in, uh, in subsidized money, uh, loaning facilities, but also a juice of uh, uh, you have to pay for your energy bill. So you can make a calculation for uh, the public affair, but also for the individual house, and you can see what scenario is uh, best. Another example of that. Uh, also, the neighborhoods are analyzed. Uh, like I said, under the ground, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure which should fit on the, the, the improvements we make in the houses. And it uh, enables us to benchmark neighborhoods and also uh, persons. We also put, a, uh, after we had surveyed, we put a lot of effort in uh, uh, comfort and uh, for uh, accessibility and um, uh, living longer in your house is one of the big issues in our country and we uh, try to um, uh, improve that and that's why we're uh, developing uh, for example uh, health labels or accessibility labels like energy labels so you can see from the outside what uh, house is fit for also we're uh, creating comfort labels 
we uh, we know that people in Holland they don't are very interested in sustainability, but but in comfort. So you can uh, uh, help people to sustain, make their houses more sustainable by uh, improving the comfort. Um, there are uh, still a lot of people in Holland who don't use uh, uh, electronic devices, so we can ha make hard uh, copy outputs, and then we can make a glossy of a house. And then he stopped. Can you uh, help me? Yes. Oh, this was. Oh, now I have ten time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. I, 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 I. I <laughs> that's too fa a bit too fast. I'm normally I'm very fast, but it was too fast. Uh, no. Well, I'll pick it up from here. Uh, we also um, uh, work with uh, uh, volunteers in our uh, uh, cooperation, the collaboration to g get the uh, uh, neighbors better. <coughs> it's not functioning again. Well, this is my uh, glossy, what I was ta uh, talking about. Uh, and now we go back. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, the next one, please. Oh. <laughs> I hope you have a, a, a bit of an idea of what I tr was trying to tell. <laughs> I was nearly at the end, so... Uh, 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 I, uh, I would like to invite everyone because it's a, an, uh, a journey uh, which uh, brought us. Uh, one of the slides told something about how we look at uh, the quality of life in uh, in our country. We did a survey on the, uh, Dutch students, and we also did the same study on the Slovakian st students. And then it seemed that there are uh, we think health is very important, but uh, in the east uh, part of Europe. Love is more important, so we can learn a lot about each other. And I, I invite everyone to look at uh, my presentation when it's online. And uh, if you're interested, uh, join us uh, to make uh, Europe a bit better. Thank you. Press the button. No, don't press the button. Okay, sorry about that. That's annoying when that happens. And we will obviously have them online, have a chance to share them. Um, hopefully, you'll have an opportunity to connect with some people later on. So, um, again, tying into lots of things we've talked about. And, and something we haven't really talked about today is, uh, but it's implicit in a lot of what we're saying is, is kind of this, whether we describe it as capacity building or, you know, building capabilities within the sector amongst our residents. Kevin talked a bit about it in terms of raising awareness. You talked a bit about it, Stuart, in terms of, you know, uh, people's access to and their their levels of competence with using IT. Uh, you've also talked about some of that stuff as well. So there's some big questions about, you know, how we bring people with us, both in the sector and also in the wide community. Some questions also about who pays for some of this stuff, which, again, is, is part of the affordability conversation we had earlier. So apologies again, but, uh, you know, hopefully we, we'll have a chance to share those slides um, after the event. Um, let's move on to our final speaker of the afternoon, uh, final speaker of this session, um, Eha. Nice to see you. Um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Remember that Eva is going to give her presentation in Estonian. So if your Estonian is as bad as mine, you might want to reach for your headset. Uh, and then we'll be going back to English for, for the conversation. Okay, thanks very much. It's me, net. Oh, so really? network. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now in Estonia. Okay. Abi Linna peana vastutan ma ka elama majanduse eest. Ja etekanne räägibki vast rohkem elama majandusest. Aga Abi Linna peana ma siis abistan Linna pead Linna juhtimises. Ja selleks, et linna hästi juhtida, et meie elanikel oleks hea, turvaline, mugav elada, et linn areneks jätkusuutlikult on vajalik infot 
koguda. Infot võib koguda ankeetada itas paberikandjal, aga tänapäeval on normaalne, et põhjame seda siis interneti teel teha. Ja nagu ma mainisin, et abilinna peana vastutama mõnitsipaal majade ehitamise korrasoju üürimise eest, siis räägingi pisut meie mõnitsipaal majadest. Mõnitsipaal maju Tallinna linnas ja kortereid kahjuks meil ei ole väga palju, et kogu üldisest hulgast on meil vaid 4%. See tähendab, et meil on kuskil 5000 korterit Tallinna linnale kuulub 38 maja ja siis veel mõned majad on meil koos erasektori ka lahendatud, et erasektor on ehitanud ja meie siis üürime. Ja käed püstikes seile käisid meie uuimat mõtsipaalmaja vaatama Suuslinna kolma õpetate maja. Mõned käisid. Me ei ole väga uhked selle õpetate maja üle. Muuses õpetate maja sai valmis õpetate päeval, mis on novembris, oktoobris eelmisel aastal ja õpetajad on meil targad inimesed. Targad inimesed elavad targas majas ja õpetate maja ongi siis keskkonna säästav. Seal on meil paneelid 135 päikese paneeli. Ligi null energia maja ja kõik uued majad, mida me nüüd hakkame ehitama vastavalt Euroopa nõuetele, ongi ligi null energia majad. Aga mis seal veel on, on väga mugav, et kui tuleb külaline, siis saab meie üürnik vaadata kuvari pealt, et kes tuleb kodust toast väljamata saab külalise sisse lasta ning meil maja omanikena on ka väga hea ja turvaline seda maja hallata sellepärast, et kaamerad on nii sees kui väljas. Näiteks oli seal üks väikene insident, kus autoda kurdas valgustusposti katki ja me saime siis teada, kes tegi, saime kahju sisse nõuda, nii samuti on võimalik lahendada ka näiteks vaidlusi üürnike vahel, sest et kaamerad koridorides annavad märku, et kes mida teeb ja kes mille eest vastutab, nii et tarkmaja. Nüüd korterüüistutega on meil väga-väga hea koostöö. Korterüüistutega me Lahendame koos parkimise probleeme, andes näiteks Linnamaad kasutusse. Me oleme Linnamaad annud kasutusse ja koos teinud parkimise platse umbes nii palju, kui on meil meie jalgpallistaadion. Ja kindlasti seda koostööd me jätkame, samuti anname me Linna poolt toetusi. Aga nüüd kõik need toetuste jagamised ja informatsiooni jagamine käib meil ka digitaalselt, et kui me siin räägime digitaalsetest lahendustest, siis on siin rohelinõu või siis hoovid korda või siis toetusrõdude korda tegemiseks, sest väga palju maju on meil ehitatud nõukogude ajalsel 60-50-70-tel nende eluiga on juba No ma loodan, et mitte lõppemas, aga igal juhul on vajalikud põhjalikud renoveerimistööd ja see tõttu on meil siis erinevad toetused ja kõik neid toetusi saab taudelda kõigepealt elektroonselt ja ametnikud siis menetlevad, koguste menetlust on võimalik ka elektroonsel teel jälgida. Nüüd kui ma veel rääkisin siin üürnikast, siis sa... Meil üürnikud saavad ka oma üürilepingutega tutvuda digitaalsel teel samamoodi ja tulevikus, lähitulevikus, ma loodan väga, et lähitulevikus saavad mitte ainult tutvuda, vaid ka pikendada või vajadusel esitada omi mõtted ettepanekuid kaebusi või siis taotlust üürilepingu lõpetamiseks. Ning meil on... Töövahendina ka kinnisvara register, 
ning äh, ilma sellet enam üldse ei kujuta ettegi seda tööd täna, kui tulin teile siia ettekannat tegema, äh, vaatasin, kuna mul ettekanda ja valmista oli maininud, et, et nüüd on meil see kinisvara register ühendatud ka maa, maa registriga, mille kaudu on võimalik siis vaadata mitte ainult kinisvara äh, andmeid, kus kohapäeval mõni korter või koolimaja või, või midagi muud paikneb, et kes haldab, milline ametiasutus haldab, milline linnaosa haldab, et saan vaadata ka plaani pealt ja siis liikuda kinisvara andmete juurde, nii et mitmepoolne andme vahetus. Ja samamoodi on linnaelanikul. Ma kasutan ise ka väga palju ühistransporti ja Enam ei kujuta ettegi, et lähen rongi või bussi peale ja, ja ei tea, mis kell rong väljab. Arvutan täpselt välja, kõige pealt vaatan mäbi pealt, mitu minutit kõnnin jaama. Arvutan välja, et mis kell ma pean toast välja minema ja rongi pealt trammi peale ja niimoodi ma tööle jõuangi ilma igasugust uumikut. Ah, muuses informatsiooniks meie... Külalistele kohalikud kõik teavad, et meie ühistransporti tasuta, eks see ole üks põhjus, miks pärast ma kasutan meie ühistransporti ja kõigepealt vältida uumikuid ja tasuta. Ja samamoodi informatsioon meil linna andmebaasist kodulehe küljalt on võimalik vaadata, millal hakkab kuskil kaevetööd või taadelda kaevamisluba tänava sulgemist ehk Tasapisi kogu meie infovahetus kolibki digimaailma. Mõned aastat tagasi detalbneeringute menetlemine oli üks pikke vaevaline töö joosti kaustadega ametnike vahet. Nüüd on nii, et projekteeria laeb ülesse ja materjal hakkab siis digitaalselt liikuma. Ja üks viimaseid lahendusi on meil Avalin mobile app. Ja selle mõte on siis see, et linnaelaniku veelki rohkem kaasata linna arengusse. Ja linnaelanik saab öelda, kuhu, mida ta soovib. Ja praegu sel hetkel siis küsitleme Baltiaama juures tunnelis on muuses küsitlus üleval, et näiteks kas inimesed pigem eeldavad maa peal käia, ehk ka sebra, üle, üle sebra kõndida või jääme sinna maale kõndima. Ja eks me seda küsitlust teemegi siis üle linna edasi sellisel kombel ja siin on nähas tunnelis, kus meil on siis väiksed reklaamid, et eks me peame oma linnaelaniku õpetama neid äppe kasutama. Ja kõige viimane lahendus, ma arvan, et see mujal ka juba tuttav, on siis see turvanupp. Et kui me muutume vanemaks, siin eelmised kolleegid näitasid ka presentatsioone, kus elukaar oli ära näidatud ja siis kui me oleme juba üsna vanad, meie omaksed ja me ise muretseme, et meie nii jõua abi küllalt ruttu ja nüüd kui inimene tunneb, et tal on halb olla, vajutab seda nupukest ja sotsiaaltöötaja või siis häirenupu kaudu saab ka kiirabi kohale või kui ka väga kaua pole seda nupu, nupu vajutatud, siis on võimalik sotsiaaltöötel tulla vaatama, et ega selle inimesega pole midagi ometisel kodus juhtunud. Nii et digimaailm tungib meie kodudesse ka heas mõttes. Aitäh teile! Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, you showed us that you know, it doesn't always have to be the most leading edge tech. I mean, the, the, the alarm button thing is just about joining up services and using things which are really quite well known to us to to provide better services for, for um, citizens. Um, and maybe just like to ask you, just as we finish up here, um, most of our audience are people who are working in social housing. They are uh, people working in uh, RSLs. Um, looking forward, and we, we spent a lot of time today trying to second guess the future and trying to anticipate what's down the road and we're all you know trying to uh, to to uh, to second guess this um but thinking about what 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 do you think are the key things they need to be thinking about in the next couple of years what are the what are the, the, the what are the priorities you think for this sector uh, and you've touched upon some of them I mean, maybe first of all uh, ask you kevin first of all around this whole question of security and how we 
get m more aware of the risks that there are. Uh, and you talked a bit about how all organisations need to be kind of on this. And big organisations, you know, we see organisations of all sizes here. Um, what are the kinds of things that you'd be telling them if you were advising them about what's coming down the tracks? Um, one thing I, um, um, I'll give you, sorry, I'll give you a mic. One, one thing I will say is that we're in the wild west at the moment as regards Internet of Things devices that companies can sell. So a company can come along and sell um, a smart smoke alarm, but there's no onus on the company to support that smart, smart alarm, and they don't. When vulnerabilities are found, they're never patched by these small devices again. So they're selling, companies are able to sell these devices, do what they want, but they don't have to adhere to a roadmap, as we say and supported the way that our operating systems on our phones are supported and uh, on our computers and our desktop, which is so important because mm -hmm. we know how they fix, they fix bugs and they improve the security. And every second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft release what we call Patch Tuesday. Sure. But with Internet of Things devices, you could, you could deploy a huge or array of them around the city and it could be obsolete, obsolete within a few years. And they could also be full of bugs and you're left with this heartache again. So. In other words, at least always look for the manufacturers. Are they the people like Cisco? Are they the people like, you know, whoever is releasing these that are household names in the IT sector? And what is their roadmap? And how, how will they fix anything that goes wrong with these devices in the near future? Okay, thanks a lot. Something I'd never thought about, but you can really see why, that, why that's an issue in terms of that connectedness. So I guess it's about, app, you might call it aftercare, but also it's our, our role as consumers to make sure that we've, we thought about those questions and thought about how we how we protect ourselves. Sure, you touched upon that a bit as well, didn't you? When you talked to me, gave that really nice example. And again, just from your perspective, and maybe something completely separate. Uh, but w w what do you think are the the kind of key things that that our audience needs to be thinking about uh, moving forward? I, I think um, technology is moving on at such a pace, and I think um, we've touched on IoT I is huge uh, for everybody with both business and residential individuals uh, but that whole area has got to mature and it's got to become a standard uh, in terms of uh, the qualities being delivered but uh, the, the the issues are that the technology is out there uh, the a lot of technology out there um, and I think it, it's the the pace of change so while we're talking about deploying equipment now to make smart cities and all the rest of it yeah. You can imagine, in five years' time, ten years' time, actually what we're deploying today might be the wrong thing or needs reinvestment to mm. be replaced or, or vulnerabilities or issues coming along. So so I think the technology rolls at such a pace. I think uh, it would be very hard if you were a futurist. Um, uh, what a great job that must be because uh, you have a constant job because it's changing all the time. <laughs> but I think the, the challenge for us is to implement mature capability when we can but do it ethically okay okay that's, that's a big challenge isn't it and art i mean you, we think about well i think about the netherlands as being as one of europe's more more advanced spaces in terms of bringing all this stuff together what's coming down the tracks what are the things that we need to be thinking about as we move forward with this fast moving conversation first of all uh Software should work. Uh, my uh, presentation was an example <laughs> of. Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, uh, but, but that's uh, the case. Uh, if you have a digitized city, it's uh, important that it's uh, robust. Yeah. yeah. Also, you should think about the ownership of data. At the moment, we are exploited by uh, American companies, and I th yeah. think we should in Europe uh, decide how we want to uh, uh, exploit data in a society. And I think data is from society. So. Uh, some things should be public and if in my own private data and there is money to make from it give it to me and not to uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or something like that yeah. and I think uh, we should uh, work together S we are up front in Holland but Holland is a tiny tiny country uh, half of uh, Shanghai for example mm -hmm. so uh, we have a scale which uh, asks us to w all work together okay Thanks a lot. Good You're point. And, and again, Housing Europe, key role in terms of connecting some of those conversations. Um, Eha, final word from you, maybe. What are the, from your experience here in Estonia and looking at how social housing providers are, are pushing this agenda, what are the things which you would prioritise in the, in the next few years as, 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 as big things for our audience to think about? Maybe. I'm just getting the translation. She's got the, yeah. 
Weet je niet, Mike? Eks me elamu ehitamisel peamegi kasutama moodsaid tehnoloogid ja muuses me PIM-süsteeme juba esimesel majal juba kasutamegi, et uus uus keskus Tallinnas keskubki valmibki juba PIMI abiga, et eks me seda tehnoloogiat pea kasutama, aga ma tahan lihtsalt seda öelda, et kui ma siin kuulasin neid päris hirmutavaid turvariske, siis ma leian, et meie ülesanne inimestele on rohkem võibolla teadvustada seda, et turvariskidega tuleb tegeleda, et selline teadvustamiskampaanid tuleb rohkem teha meie poolt. Okay, thank you. So, for those of you, because we, we've got way too many gadgets here <laughs> on the stage, and I guess in a couple of years' time, we'll have a little sort of chip in our ear that translates everything. So at the moment, we're still a uh, wee bit clunky, but essentially that was about public awareness. It was about uh, building people's, just making you know, making them the kind of things that Kevin's talked about and that, that's been mentioned about uh, making them aware of the risks, mm -hmm. building capacity, teaching them, uh, equipping them to, to, to look after themselves because we can't look after everybody. So uh, it all starts with the individual. Um, can you join me and say thank you very much to our panel, our final panel of the afternoon. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. If you want to go and take your seats in the, uh, in the audience, and I'll invite Cedric to come and join me for some, uh, a few final reflections. So what we wanted to do at the end is I'm just going to uh, maybe just ask Cedric maybe to share some of the key comments. Yeah, please, wherever you like. Let me go and find you something that you can speak into that we can... There we go. So, I mean, I'd, I'd just be keen, first of all, and, and, you know, I guess the Adam Greenfield conversation already seems a long time away <laughs> because there's been a huge amount of water under the bridge and, a, you know, a, you know a, a lot of stuff we've discussed. Um, but we can usually pick out a few, usually you leave these events, there's a few things you pick out which stick with you. So maybe share with us some of the things you're taking away, some of the key things that stick out for you, and then we'll maybe ask some of the audience members to do the same. Yeah? Yeah. Um it, it was a very high-level conference, uh, and I'm very happy about how in Europe uh, is able to, to build such event. But uh, if I know before how many interveners we have, I refuse to do the summarize of this <laughs> day. <you know? laughs> yeah, they didn't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but but I, I, as I accept before, uh, I'm obliged to do that. Uh, I think that today there was something for everyone, uh, from the technophobe to the tech fans. Probably part of you are afraid, and other part of you are very exciting by, uh, by all this presentation. For me, uh, as I said this morning, uh, finally, I'm still optimistic. Uh, even if we discover that uh, there is no smart city, and uh, that it's just a buzzword, uh, smart city with all house being dumb. Is it real smart city, said Cole Virkus. Uh, I'm still optimistic because we began to answer together what are city for and what are the cities supposed to do? Smart cities supposed to build, share and product, we said. And uh, I um, check to uh, Twitter because Michaelis spent all his time to tweet <laughs> on how was in Europe and finally it's a good way to remember what people said <laughs> during this day. Uh, there is one citation, one quote of uh, Mr. Yarg, technology is not smart by itself, cities don't have to be smart, we have to. And second point, uh, the definition um, from Kimo Ronka Kopunki, I don't know if it's a real pronunciation in <laughs> Finnish, but Kopunki, the Finnish word for housing can help us indeed keep in mind that no matter what the mission of the city is to serve its citizen. First point. Uh, I'm still optimistic even if post-human is already here. Even if post-human economic, post-human politic is here. And I'm still optimistic because we learn that we have to, and that's probably one of the key points of this day, not just actant, but to be agent, not operant, but be subject of urban space. And like that, create the condition of justice 
and because as a lot of experience makes a proof that regulation has an impact on how to build a fair city. So post-human uh, economic politic uh, models must invent human regulation. Finally, uh, I could summarize this point like that. Post-human still need human, and it's a good thing, I think. Uh, two other uh, quotes uh, from, Twitter, from Twitter. Need for human-centric approach, more common spaces, bring people together to fight loneliness, uh, from Kimi Ronka, and posteroic technology implementation by local authorities may be key in unlocking further potential of our cities, uh, citation from a quote from uh, Greenfield. And third point, uh, I'm still optimistic because finally we didn't address the huge question, technology, good mm -hmm. or evil. Uh, and it's, it's a good thing, I think, uh, because have this question in our minds, finally, it's probably the best way to take the good decision. Uh, and last quote, uh, pr probably one of the sentences which can help us to, to know how we are going to work together tomorrow. Uh, there is no way out from the experiment called the city. The only way to alleviate the consequences is to experiment on a reasonably scale to give and receive continuous feedback and how things are working out. So I, I will propose, let's start something else, shall we? And uh, the, the other quote uh, that I like, don't plan, just do it. I think that probably it's a more uh, simple quote, but the more efficient quote that uh, we have during this day. Um, but before I conclude, let me thanks uh, to all involved, to speaker, to Hekil and Housing Europe uh, in particular, and please, I will ask you some applause for him, Michaelis, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, who organized uh, this uh, very, very high-level conference. Uh, I know that uh, there is a, 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 a team in Housing Europe, but you are very focused on this event, on the choice of the uh, whole people who uh, take the floor here. So thank you very much for the work uh, you have done for organizing this, uh, this conference. Um, uh, I, I want, uh, of course, uh, thanks uh, the special guest and all of you uh, to be there and stay here, even if uh, the sun asks us to discover this lovely town of Tallinn. But uh, you are very brave to stay with us uh, all during the day, so thank you. And uh, to conclude, I will invite you uh, in Lyon. Uh, it's not me, it's Sorka who said me to, to say that because I come <laughs> from Lyon. But uh, so, so I, I want to, to, to share with you that uh, it's the idea of uh, Sorka. I want to invite you in, uh, in Lyon in 2019, uh, in the, during the month of June, for the next International Social Housing Festival and discover together how we can address uh, this huge t challenge of uh, housing for all and how the different countries uh, do that. We are very pleased to welcome in one year in Lyon to discover that together. Thank you for your great animation. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Eddie. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, Cedric. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I was going to open the floor, but uh, I think you've kind of said everything that has to be said. And I think now, you know, I, I didn't get to where I am today by not being able to read a room. So reading this room, I think you guys would rather be out there than in here. So thanks to all of you. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, let's carry on the conversations and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your evening. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>